This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum, a repository of death. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames which houses Scotland Yard is a warehouse of homicide where everyday objects, a package of cigarettes, a length of string, a linen napkin, all are touched by murder. It's a Gladstone bag. It's a familiar object. Every railroad train carries several inevitably useful, compact and expandable. They always hold more than they seem. They're perfect for vacation. Perfect also for... If you look inside, Inspector, just to uh, pry the two halves apart at one end, as I did. Yes, I see. Hmm, odd objects to have in a valise. Not if one had every intention of disposing of them, Inspector. Today, that Gladstone bag can be seen in the Black Museum. <laughs> From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. <laughs> Museum starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's mausoleum of murder. There are times, as I open this door, you know, that I feel the old familiar inscription should be carved on the lintel. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Yes, abandon hope of peaceful, quiet, dreamless sleep. For within this room is almost every instrument which ever has been used for the commission of the foul deed called murder. Yes, here lies death. No doubt about it. You feel it in the dull, oppressive atmosphere. You see it first marked calmly on the neatly lettered cards. So-and-so died by this instrument at the hands of so-and-so, dated, and so forth. Your glance passes to the thing itself. You almost feel the blood. Here's a camera. Ordinary tourist snapshot-taking camera. Yet within the blackness of this box, the film registered two faces. A third person saw a print. And from that recognition, three people died. One by a hangman's rope. Here's a briar pipe, well smoked, thoroughly discolored, a pleasure to a pipe smoker, but no pleasure to the man who inhaled hydrocyanic gas with his tobacco, nor to the killer, trapped by the pipe itself. Ah, here we are, the Gladstone bag, piece of luggage for a man. It looks so commonplace, so much as if it belonged to a traveling salesman, not to Jim Hudson. Of course, in a way, Jim was a traveling salesman. He certainly had a sales talk. And he was quite successful at it. Sally, I've never seen you looking lovelier. Oh, Jimmy, you always do that. Do what, sweetheart? Say things like that, just when I want to pick a fight with you. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I love you so much. Despite your wife and everything else. Everything else? That's what I wanted to fight with you about. We... 
Well, we just can't go on like this, Jimmy, darling. Why not? We're as happy as circumstances. Don't you see, Jimmy? A woman wants at least a snatch of domesticity, not just clandestine meetings with the clock ticking away her happiness in the background. It'll come, darling. It'll come. The girl was right, of course, from her point of view. Granted that the relationship between her and the man she loved was, well, outside the recognized bounds. Granted that they found each other when it seemed too late. Still, the girl was right. She wanted a certain sense of security, which can come to a woman only through the small things of making coffee in the morning while a man was shaving with an earshot. And Sally James was the kind of girl who took action when she wanted something badly enough. Jim, what about the week we planned together for this spring? I probably could get away, darling, if we had a place to go. I have the place. Anyway, the ad about it. You are something, aren't you? Here, darling. I found this in the Sunday paper. Go on, read it. For rent. Bungalow. The beaches. Pevensey Bay, Eastbourne. Reasonable by the week. You've got your heart set on this, haven't you, sweet? Can we do it? The week of April 12th. All right? All right. Oh, Jimmy, it'll be heaven down there by the sea. Heaven by the sea. Poor girl, one of those human beings who believes with all her heart that dreams can become reality. Perhaps it was just as well that Sally didn't see her gym some two evenings later in a quiet little restaurant not more than three blocks from the place she'd given Jim her precious clipping. Rhoda, my darling, I've never seen you looking lovelier. Oh, come off it, Jimmy. That kind of romancing just isn't in my style. You're a woman, aren't you? Well, you ought to know, Jimmy boy. (laughs) And how? Thanks. Look, Rhoda, I've taken a cottage at Pevensey Bay. Oh, how inconvenient to have to travel all that distance. Not for weekends, it isn't. Inconvenient. Well, the daring young man on the flying trapeze. (laughs) Would you like weekends by the sea, Rhoda? Why not? I think it'd be fun. Nice place. Called the Beaches. Old garden, private bathing beach. Sounds marvellous. I thought you'd like it. Well, I can't make it this weekend. Neither can I. How about the weekend of the 16th? We'd go down Friday afternoon, come back early Monday morning. There's a very early train. It's a deal, Jimmy. It really is a deal. A clever rascal, Jim Hudson, without a doubt. Knows his way with the ladies. But he cuts his margins rather close, doesn't he? Not the dates. April 12th, the week, with Sally... Friday the 16th with Rhoda. And that's hardly a full week with Sally. But, of course, Sally doesn't know about this on Friday noon the 9th as she stands in the doorway of the railway carriage in Waterloo Station. You will be down by Monday, won't you, Jimmy, dear? Sooner than that, if I can. You know that, darling. I guess I feel like a little girl on her first trip alone. I'm sorry it has to be this way. Oh, I don't mind, really. I'll have a chance to put the cottage in shape. Have it all clean and comfortable for my man. When I saw it, there weren't any tools there. And there's always something to fix. I'd better add tools to my shopping list. Oh, and don't forget the travelling iron I asked you for, dear. And please hurry to get down and... Oh, kiss me. Quick, Jimmy, the train's leaving. Oh, Jimmy, dearest. Bye, darling. See you Monday. Monday it'll be. Take care, darling. Take care. Watch him as he walks up the platform. The train is already disappearing from the track. Jim has his hands in his pockets. He's whistling merrily, a man with nothing on his mind except his love affair and the prospect of the week ahead. He leaves the station, walks up the street a ways, pauses before a hard wish. What was it he added to his shopping list? Oh, yes, tools. He enters the shop. May I assist you, sir? Yes, yes, I think you can. What do you wish? Uh, you've got some fine-looking knives in the window. May I see them? Any particular blade size up? I think, um, yes, yes, the ten-inch carver will be about right. Uh, very well, sir. There we are, sir. Best Sheffield steel. Hollow ground, razor sharp, and guaranteed to hold temper. It will take very little honing to keep the edge, sir. Mm, very efficient-looking. Do you prefer the bone or the plastic handle? 
backbone, I think. Very good, sir. Is there anything else? I think, um, yes, sir. A small cross-cut saw. Small, about uh, 18 inches. Perfect. Excellent quality, as you can hear. Good. Would you wrap them, please? But then that will be 6, 10, 4, sir. I'll just make up the slip. You'll have your package in a moment. Jim Hudson took his package on the train with him on Monday morning. And tea time at the beaches, Pevensey Bay, promised to be exciting. And wonderful. Isn't this wonderful, Jimmy? I discovered the path to the top of the cliff on Sunday. Oh, Jimmy, it's paradise. It is a nice view. And so alone, so private. This is our private view, darling. It's, it's like a honeymoon. You are a sweet little thing, Sally. That is. I know. When you call me sweet, you think of me as a child. But I love you as a woman, Jimmy. I know. Shall we go back now? It looks like it may kick up a storm. If you want to, darling. Whatever you want. Whatever he wants, Sally. But does he know what he wants, this man with a wife in London, you at the beaches, and still a third woman waiting to join him just four days from now? It's too bad the beach isn't sand. Oh, I don't know. Shale isn't bad. Funny about this place. Funny? How, darling? Do you remember the Doris Clark case? Who was she? She's the reason the beaches was available. I don't understand. She lived here. Two men she knew came down. She was beaten. Buried alive in the shale. The men hung. How horrible. They made a lot of mistakes, or they mightn't have been caught. People shy away from a house with that kind of a story. I don't care. We'll change its reputation, then, with our love. Let's go inside, dear. It's getting chilly with the sun gone and the storm coming up. The storm came, the rain pounded on the roof, the wind lashed at the sea. And within the cottage called the beaches, all was snug and warm. I love a fire in a fireplace. Don't you, Jimmy, darling? Yes, I suppose I do. Oh, Jim. Am I being too sticky? Sentimental? A trifle. What's wrong, Jimmy? You've been, well, far away today. Sally, let's face it. Things like this never go on for long. Jim! Jimmy, I don't believe you said that. I did say it. I mean it. Then why did you bring me down here? It was your idea. I went along with it, hoping we could work something out. Work it out? It's past the... You just... You never loved me. Stop crying. I can't stand crying. I ruined my life for you. Now you want to just forget about me. Stop it. Grow up. You can't be infantile forever. You want your cake and to have it too. You want your wife and other women. You won't. I won't let you. Stop it, Sally. I told you to stop it. Jim, no. No, I didn't mean it. I'll do whatever you want. I'll go away and never see you again. I'll... Jim, don't touch me. Jim, please. Jim. Jimmy. The scene was set, save for one vital piece of evidence. A black Gladstone bag, which can be seen today in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. <laughs> Thank you. 
And now we continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Friday, the 16th of April, dawned fine and clear. A calm, gay Jim Hudson made his way, whistling as usual through the weekend-bound crowds of Waterloo Station. Well, here you are, my good man. <laughs> Glad you think I'm a good man. <laughs> I am. Uh, well, I think you are. <laughs> By Monday morning, I'll know. <laughs> then let's make that train, baby. Pevensey Bay on number seven. The train to Pevensey Bay was none too fast for Jim and Rhoda. It was a fine spring day. It was a beautiful spring evening. The moonlight made the rollers on the beach gleam with a lovely phosphorescence. On the porch of the cottage, known as the beaches. Know something, Jimmy boy? I know lots of things, old girl. What, for instance? Oh, this. If I were the romantic type, this place would make me go all gooey. But you're not? No, I'm not. All your misconceptions of women notwithstanding... Then you want to waste all this moonlight and romance? Oh, come, darling. If you must whisper sweet nothings, come and whisper them. Why not out here? Because I don't feel comfortable on the shale. Come along now. Always let the woman have her way, particularly after she's cooked a beautiful dinner. Here now. I'm the only beautiful thing around here this weekend. And you are, Rhoda. You are. What a way you have. In here, darling. No, no, not in there. It's a, it's a spare room, not made up. I want to see it. Oh, nothing in there. Well, are you going to deny me anything, darling? It's locked. I... Uh... Oh, Jimmy. No. Say, what are you? Bluebeard or something? Maybe I am. <laughs> The door stayed locked. The weekend at Pevensey Bay was quite successful. But now the scene changes to a London street lined with somewhat shabby buildings which house somewhat shabby offices. Into one of those buildings, a woman hurries almost furtively. She climbs the stairs, one flight, walks into an office, the door of which announces in gold lettering, Cross Detective Agency. You are Mr. Cross? I am. What can I do for you, Mrs... Uh... Mrs.? Uh, oh, my ring. Yes, an old trick. Uh, you sit down, won't you? Thank you. My name is Lillian Hudson, Mrs. Lillian Hudson. I see. Well, how can I help you? I, uh, I want some information on my husband, James Hudson. Go on, please. I saw your advertisement. Were you formerly with Scotland Yard? I was. Advancement seems slow. I'm working for myself now. Yes. Well, I have reason to believe that my husband has been, well, seeing other women. Oh, and you want me to get the evidence? I think so. A divorce action? Perhaps it depends on the results. And you want to stay in the background? For the present. Hmm. Oh, have you anything on which I can start? Uh, an address? A lead of any kind? I have this. A baggage check. Waterloo Station baggage storage. Stamp 10 a.m. Friday, April 16th. An innocent bit of baseball. Where did you get this, Mrs. Hudson? I took one of my husband's suits to the cleaner. This was in a pocket. The cleaner gave it to me. Oh, and why should this mean anything? Because Jim, my husband, was away the entire week of the 12th until the morning of the 19th. It came to me, if he had told the truth, how could he have checked something at Waterloo on the 16th if he were out of town all that week? Yes, an interesting observation, Mrs. Hudson. Well, suppose I go over to Waterloo Station and pick up whatever was checked there. Oh, and uh, <clears throat> sorry to mention this, but uh, it is customary to have a retainer, you know. Private Detective Cross, once of Scotland Yard, went on over to Waterloo Station and presented the baggage check. A short while later, he arrived in the office of Inspector Henley at the yard. Ah, oh, yes, Cross, I remember you now. Ah, oh, thank you, Inspector. You were with us once, weren't you? Yes, sir. 
<laughs> you know, there are times, Cross, when I wish I had the gumption to strike out on my own. Too late now, however. And there are times, Inspector, when I wish I'd stayed on here. However... Yes, to each his own, and the grass is always greener, and so on. Well, Sergeant Anderson said you wanted to show me something. Oh, yeah, this, sir. This Gladstone bag. Hmm. Looks perfectly normal. Locked, I see. Yes, if you look inside, Inspector, just uh, pry the two halves apart at one end, as I did. Yes, I see. Oh, odd objects to have in a valise. Not if one had every intention of disposing of them, Inspector. Uh, you're probably right about that. Seems like some sook or something. And badly stained. If I were a gambling man, I'd give ten to one the stains of blood, sir. And it wouldn't be much of a gamble. Any ideas on what the metal objects are? Well, I flashed my pen light in there, sir. One is a carving knife, and the other is a carpenter's saw. I see. How did you come into possession of this bag, Cross? Uh, Mrs. Hudson found the check for it in her husband's pocket. <laughs> she says the cleaner found it. I doubt that. Divorce action, I assume. Correct, sir. I understand. Well, my suggestion is this. We'll give you another stub. Give it to Mrs. Hudson and have her place it in her husband's pocket. When he comes back with the bag, we'll have a man ready to pick him up. It seems to me this little matter bears further investigation. So simple, so quietly effective. Just place a check for baggage in a man's pocket. When he comes to claim his Gladstone bag. Yes, sir. Oh, here's my check. It's a brown Gladstone. Left it three days ago. Just a moment, sir. Sergeant Anderson, sir. Yes? It's the check you've been waiting for, that fellow there, whistling. Thank you. Give him the bag. I'll speak to him. Yes, that's my bag. Oh, that'll be two and six, sir, for overtime storage. Oh, here we are. Thank you, sir. Glad to oblige. Uh, excuse me, sir. Are you James Hudson? That's right. Who are you? Uh, Sergeant Anderson, Scotland Yard. My credentials. If you would be good enough to come with me. What for? Uh, Inspector Henley would like to see you. He's waiting at the police station, just a block or two from the station here. Well, I've got my bag here. Couldn't it wait tomorrow, or...? Uh, that's all right, Mr. Hudson. I'll carry your bag. The squad room at the police station near Waterloo was very quiet. Inspector Hanley sat behind a battered desk. On the desk rested the Gladstone bag, open now, and next to it a file. A familiar dossier from the criminal records office. We have your file, as you see, Hudson. I see. Theft, burglary... Five years for criminal assault. Does your wife know about these things, Hudson? No, she doesn't. I see. Hudson, how do you account for the contents of this bag? I, um, I was butchering half a steer for a friend of mine in the country. He has a deep freeze. Oh, that's rather thin, Hudson. Did you wear a silk dress size 10 to butcher the steer in? It was his wife's. I'm having it cleaned at a special place I know of. Yes, yes, of course. Better try again, Hudson. There was no answer. There were no further questions. Inspector Henley knew his man. Time ticked away. The clock was quite loud. For an hour it ticked in the silence. Finally the perspiration beginning to bead his forehead. Jim Hudson began to talk. All right, Inspector. I'll tell you. I guess I lost my head when she flew at me. Oh, size ten and she flew at you, Hudson. I told her we were through, that I was going back to my wife. She heaved the coal scuttle. Then it... It was at the beaches at Pevensey Bay on April 13th, sir. She grabbed the poker. I defended myself. We had a devil of a struggle. She fell, struck her head on the andiron. She was dead. I must have gone completely crazy. I, I went into town, but... But that knife had... And the saw, I was afraid to tell anyone. I mean, my record. And... He said in this bedroom, Sergeant. I've got something here, Inspector. In this biscuit tin. Yes, you have. Neat packing job, I must say. <laughs> Not much left of the poor girl, is there? I want a check of every hardware store in the neighborhood where Hudson lives. Uh, and, oh, yes, near the railway station. Got that, Sergeant? I want the sales stiff on those implements and the clerk who sold them, if possible. 
Yes, Inspector, I remember the incident perfectly. The fellow came in whistling, asked about the knives in the window. He bought one, then asked for a small saw. Here's the slip, sir. Well, this says April the 9th. Hudson claims he didn't buy these things until the 13th. It was the 9th, Inspector. I'll stake my life on that. It's no good, Hudson. You bought that knife and that saw on Friday the 9th. You went to Pevensey Bay prepared to do exactly what you did do. If we ever had evidence of premeditation, we've got it now. You're under arrest, charged with willful murder. And I must warn you that anything you say may be used in evidence. Each clue in its place. The case was complete. Closed as tightly as that same Gladstone bag. Which can be found today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Here, in person, is Orson Welles. There was no question about it. Jim Hudson, despite his claim, the usual claim of accidental death, was convicted of homicide and sentenced to the brief but final walk at eight o'clock, one winter morning. On the scaffold, his feet bound, the white hood already in its place over his head, the rope with its knot of thirteen coils around his neck, Jim Hudson lunged forward, trying to escape the trap. The executioner pulled the lever, the trap fell... Jim was pulled backward, striking his head against the wooden flooring. He may have died before the rope had its customary effect. However, the Gladstone bag is still to be found in its customary place in Scotland Yard, in the Black Museum. Till we meet again next time, in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum, I remain, as always, obediently yours. The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attractions. The program is written by Ara Marion, with original music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.